section, my right, center section or my right section, and turn to Amos chapter 7, if you would, please. Beginning a new series today, preaching through the book of Amos. We are starting in chapter 7, so as to give us an introduction as to the author, uh, the human author, the, the, uh, the character of the book. And so we are uh, seeking to uh, sort of describe him, define him, believing it will give us uh, a good foundation for the book itself, and so glad that you are here this morning. Just a couple of other things to uh, please keep in prayer. Uh, my mom, uh, who is involved in the car accident on Wednesday, uh, woke up uh, the next day a little sore, the next day a little sore, and today very much sore, and so uh, uh, struggling to move today uh, just to get out of bed and, and so forth. Uh, being of her age and the severity of the accident, uh, we praise the Lord that it wasn't worse, and uh, the other person ran a red light and hit her, uh, confessed to the police officer that it was their fault, all those things. So that side of things is uh, a blessing, but uh, nonetheless still, in, still uh, struggling this morning. Uh, my dad was in a car accident about two months ago. He's still struggling. He goes, uh, I can almost go without a cane now. It's a, so uh, pray for Pastor Sutton and Miss Judy, if you would please, Bethel Baptist Church in La Plata, Maryland, that God might bless them. Well, Amos chapter 7 this morning. Amos chapter 7 and verse number 14. Now, we're starting a series preaching through Amos, and we're starting near the end, okay? So we, we're trying to reveal, we're trying to grasp and get a hold of sort of the nature of the book, the, the characteristics of the book, the, the author itself. Now, the author, of course, the divine author is God. The human author is Amos. God uh, 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 breathed it. Uh, 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 Amos then penned it. But we want to get to know sort of what's going on. And so uh, we find ourselves today in chapter number 7. This is what's taking place. The ruling class in the nation of Israel has told Amos to go home. They don't want to listen to him. Okay, he's preaching. They've basically said, go home. I can't imagine what that would be like uh, to show up and uh, everybody's kind of standing out front and I get here and they're like, nope, don't even bother getting out of the car. Just keep driving. You're not welcome here. We don't want you here. We took a vote this morning and uh, you're gone. That's what they're saying. All right. So this is his response. Amos chapter 7, verse number 14. Then answered Amos and said unto Amaziah, Amaziah is this false prophet, this false priest. I was no prophet. Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Pausing for effect here, okay? This is, this is, this is Amos, all right? You said, don't preach. You said, I'm not welcome here. You said, go back home. This is what God says. Verse 17, therefore thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. John Wayne got nothing on Amos. Come on, that's, that's, mm. Our title this morning is this, Amos, an introduction. 
Amos, an introduction as we start the series. Lord, would you help us this morning to get a good grasp of, Lord, sort of the overall uh, text? I know, Lord, that's hard for a full book, but it's a small book, and certainly with your help, Lord, we can do that. May we learn, but may we not just fill our, knowledge, our head with knowledge, Lord. May we, we have wisdom from that knowledge, the application of it, Lord, that we would see ourselves in the texts, and that, Lord, we might respond uh, correctly and properly. Would you encourage those that seek to do right? Would you rebuke those and, and bring those to yourself that are indifferent, Lord, about doing that which is right? Myself included, Lord, at times. Would you help us in this today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you know someone named Amos? Okay, a few people. How many of you know multiple people named Amos? It's not exactly a, a, a popular name. How many of you know someone named Elijah? How many of you know someone named Jeremiah? How many of you know somebody named John? All right, these are more, more popular. How many of you know somebody named David? How many of you know someone named Park? Okay, we're just joking, all right. The, uh, uh, those are more popular Bible names and, and names of prophets. Amos is probably, if we were to give him an award, if we were to give him some recognition this morning, this would be his reward or, or award, this would be his recognition. He's probably the least known of all the minor prophets, of all the prophets. I um, mean, Hosea, we can tell, uh, if you know your Bible, uh, Hosea is the story of Hosea and Gomer. Come on, and, and the great love that God has for his people. Um, the uh, uh, Joel, the, the book of Joel would be, God has restored the years that the, cankers of the, uh, the, the, the canker worm hath eaten, and, and uh, restoring unto us the joy of our salvation. Uh, the book of Jonah would be known primarily from the story of? Jonah and the whale. And so uh, Amos doesn't have any of those things. Amos doesn't have these, these glaring stories, these wonderful stories that we would have been taught from our youth downstairs and, and in our Sunday school departments and Sunday school classrooms. And, and, and nor is it a, a, a big book in the sense of uh, like Jeremiah having multiple chapters and the book of Isaiah having 66 chapters and, and uh, 50 plus in Jeremiah. And so he, he's not like that. It's only nine chapters long. In fact, the most famous verse in the book of Amos would probably be Amos chapter 3 and verse number 3, which says this, can two walk together except they be agreed? And that's probably just about the only verse that's really quoted or, or referenced uh, consistently out of the book of Amos. And so he's just kind of relegated to this, this minor prophet. We might say in our vernacular, this isn't accurate, but just for our understanding, he's kind of a bench warmer prophet. He, he's not that well known. But I'm telling you, as we study this uh, over the next few weeks and months, we'll learn this. He's not, he doesn't take a back seat to anybody. He doesn't take a back seat. He, he, he's not a bench warmer. He's not a minor prophet in the sense that he's not important or significant. He is only a minor prophet in the sense that there's only nine chapters in his book versus 66 like Isaiah. Or, or uh, like Elijah and, and uh, Ezekiel, excuse me, those prophets. Uh, those are known as the major prophets. He is a vital and pivotal Bible character whom God greatly used. The name Amos means burden bearer. Burden bearer. And he had a burden to bear. So let's look at our character first this morning and, and uh, learn about Amos and who he is. Of course, we'll make application this morning, uh, but we're going to give information and then application. All right, so they'll be kind of in two different phases today, unlike how we would typically do it. Uh, uh, they'll be in two different sections. So our character today, uh, the first thing we learned about our character today was that he was a herdman. He was a herdman. In verse number 14, Then answered Amos and said unto Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. A herdman is what? What would we call a herdman? Uh, shepherd, all right, or a rancher, uh, somebody who deals with the flocks, with, with animals, all right? But then it also says that he had a side hustle. He was a gatherer of sycamore fruit. You say, why a side hustle? It doesn't say he was a planter or a grower of sycamore fruit. He said he was a gatherer. So uh, there must have been some that were uh, in a field sort of abandoned by others, and he would go and gather those on the side. He's not a very well-to-do man. He's not a wealthy man. He's not from a religious background. I use the religious terms religious there in a broad sense, in a, in a good sense. Most of the time religion isn't good. But uh, uh, he's, not, he's not a preacher himself. He didn't grow up in a preacher's home. This was foreign to him. This was, this was different to him. He was just a, a common man. He didn't go to Bible college. 
You go, well, they didn't have Bible college. No, specifically in the Old Testament, it's called the School of the Prophets. And, and uh, uh, we read about that yesterday uh, in our devotion, our men's devotion class. And, and uh, the Bible college students were complaining their dorms were too small. And so Elijah said, well, then go cut down some trees and build a bigger dorm. Quit complaining about stuff and fix it. Uh, pastor, the toilet's not working. Okay, plunger's downstairs. Come on, instead of just complaining about something, let's do something about it. And so that's what that text was about there. Uh, he didn't go to Bible college. Um, he used common words and common illustrations. He's a man, maybe more than any of the other minor prophets, especially when you factor in uh, how little there is of his book. Um, he uses common illustrations and common examples. He uses grasshoppers as an example as an illustration. He uses fire as an illustration. He uses the, a plumb line as an illustration. The plumb line is probably the most famous of his illustrations. And a, a plumb line is just a, uh, it looks like a top tied to a string and uh, it will absolutely always find 90 degrees. And so you can hold it up to a wall to see if it's plumb, to see if it's straight. You can hold it up to a stick and see if it's plumb, see if it's straight. It will tell you the truth. That's why the title of our series is Measuring Up. Because what Amos is trying to do is hold us up next to a plumb line and see how straight we are. Come on, see if we're right or not. This is our plumb line. Not society. Not what our mom tells us. Come on, our mom tells us typically we're pretty good. Your mom also told you you're really good at basketball. You never got off the bench. Moms lie, okay? They're, they're kind and they're gracious, but they will, will, be, will be kind even in our assessment. They exaggerate your abilities, all right? And, uh, uh, but the plumb line never lies. The plumb line tells us whether or not we are straight or not. He uses summer fruit as illustration. He uses very, very common, basic things uh, as illustrations to teach us and to, uh, to educate us. Um, he's the oldest prophet. He's the oldest of all of the prophets. Uh, when he started his ministry, he was beyond the typical age of most of the prophets. Fact is, when he started his ministry, he was at the age where most ended. We find that he is also in the lineage of Joseph, uh, the stepdad of Jesus, husband of Mary, and he's in the, the lineage there of him. Um, he is a, uh, a, a contemporary of uh, a likely knew Jonah and Elisha when he was a young man. He knew Isaiah and Micah as he was an old man, and he was a contemporary of Hosea, the prophet there, Hosea. He's very bold. <clears throat> I said he's very bold. In verse number 16, he says, uh, you say, don't preach the word of God, don't prophesy against the house of Israel. But uh, this is what God says. God says your wife will be a harlot in the city. Now that's one thing to pronounce it generally. Come on, if I said this morning that your wife will be a harlot in the city, that'd be bad enough. But he's talking to Amaziah. He's talking there to a spiritual leader. He's spe specifying one person when he says your, your wife's going to be a harlot in the city. He's not being vague and speaking to a crowd. He's being specific and talking to a person. That's a whole different thing. Come on, if I said this morning, if I preached this morning and said all of you are sinners, most people wouldn't, wouldn't shake their head no, most people wouldn't get mad. If I said uh, most of you are prideful, we would, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I came over here to Zach this morning and said, you know what, Zach is a sinner. He has sinned a lot this week. He has sinned in pride this week. He has lied. To, come on. Some of you are like, whoa, Zach's on a hole. I'm glad I didn't sit in the front row today. All right? He is, he is preaching very boldly in what he's saying. He says, Your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword. Thy land shall be divided by line. Thou shalt die in a polluted land. And Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. Uh, God says, you're going to leave the land that is rightfully God's. And God's going to let you be taken away. He is very bold. Where does that boldness come from? Well, people are just kind of born that way. Some people are just just born bold, and they're just, they're just that way. Yes, and other people grow into it. No, no, other people grow into it. Well, how could he be so bold? He's a farmer. He's a rancher. How could he be so bold? 43 times, listen, in nine chapters, and you think about it, sometimes nine chapters in the Bible can be page after page after page after page. If you were reading along in the Bible reading schedule this morning, I believe we read Le Leviticus chapter 13, uh, was 59 verses in, in one chapter. That's a, that's a longer chapter. These aren't 59 verse chapters. 
Okay, verse, chapter 6 is 14, chapter 7, verse 7 is 17, chapter 8, 14 verses, uh, uh, chapter 9, 14, 15 verses. They're not long chapters at all. Not long chapters at all. And yet, in very short order, he uses the term, thus saith the Lord, 43 different times. When you can say, God says, you can say it boldly. No, when you can say God says, you can say it boldly. So Brother Gabe, we'll use Brother Gabe and Miss Diane. Brother Gabe and Miss Diane come to me and say, Pastor, we're just, just illustrative purposes this morning. They come to me and say, Pastor, we're having some marital problems and, and uh, we want a divorce. You know what I can tell them boldly? God does not want you to have a divorce. I can boldly tell them that. Why can't I boldly tell them that? Because that's what the Bible says. You go, well, there's exceptions. Yeah, yeah. But even in that exception, he says it was for the hardness of your heart. Come on. That's a, that's a pretty bold. God does not want them to do that. I can be bold in that because that's what the Bible says. Now, if they come to me and they say, Pastor, um, we're, we're struggling. Um, we're arguing about a financial matter. Uh, Brother Gabe wants to buy a house. Miss Diane doesn't want to buy the house. And we're struggling. What should we do? I don't know. I have no clue. Well, well, you're the preacher. You're supposed to have a clue. No, no. I'm supposed to have a clue what the Bible says. So I would ask them things about what the Bible says. Are you tithing? Yes. Okay. Good. Then do what God says. But we're fighting. Are you tithing? No. Then, then do that before you do anything else. We can be bold where the Bible is blunt and where the Bible is specific and where we know what the Bible says, but it's hard to be bold when we don't know what the Bible says. It's hard to be bold when we're standing on our own opinion. Absolutely you should buy the house. I have no clue if they should buy the house. Boldness comes from the Bible. Boldness comes from our knowledge of the Bible. He was bold because he was able to say, thus saith the Lord. In fact, there probably shouldn't be very much boldness without the Bible. Well, I know how to raise my family. Amen. I mean, that, that's great. We don't need wimps and, and wusses trying to raise families. But if you can't quote a verse, if you can't point to a passage of Scripture, maybe we ought to tone down the boldness just a little bit and, and, and leave the boldness for when we absolutely can define it by power of Scripture. Yeah. He was bold because he was able to say, Thus saith the Lord. He was bold, and our text is silent on this. I think we see it back in just a few verses earlier in chapter number 7. I didn't write down the reference, but uh, he goes to Bethel, uh, which is the seat of calf worship, of, of Baal worship there in the nation of, of uh, Israel. Um, goes and preaches right in the heart of it. Uh, we would liken this to, he goes right down to downtown Las Vegas and preaches on morality. Come on. He goes to San Francisco, in the heart of San Francisco, and preaches against uh, hedonism or, or uh, uh, worldly philosophies. I mean, he, he goes right into the belly of the beast. It was written, the, the book was written, the, uh, what I entitled The What, When, and Where, somewhere around 764 to 755-ish. Uh, there are some variations on that. If the God would have wanted us to know an exact date, he would have told us an exact date. He does tell us uh, a general time in uh, chapter 1 and verse number 1, the Bible says, uh, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, of course, Uzziah died in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, we see that recorded for us. And so we have a general idea of it. We don't have a, a specific time frame of it. He's from the south. Go, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I just thought some of you would identify with that. I was, I was talking to a gentleman this last week and uh, describing some people to him. And I said, now they're from the south. And he started laughing and he goes, I'm from Georgia. So we can probably understand each other. All right, he's from the south, not from Georgia, he's from Judah. He's from the southern kingdom, okay? Just a quick history lesson again. Remember Rehoboam after Solomon died? Uh, Rehoboam, the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel split. The northern kingdom went under Jeroboam. The southern kingdom went under Rehoboam. So they have a split kingdom, north and south, Israel and Judah. North never had any good kings. They never had a good king. Now they had times where some bad kings did some okay things, but they never had a good king. The south, we'll mention this tonight, only had six good kings. Uh, they had 20 kings, and only six of them were good. The north had 19 kings, and none of them were good. He's from the south, but God sends him to the north. 
God sends him to a different culture. God sends him to a different group of people. So, we could call him this way, he's a missionary. No, no, that's what we call people who leave their homeland and go somewhere else to preach the gospel and live there and preach the gospel there. We call those missionaries. So Amos is a, a missionary. He goes to the, to the north. He goes there approximately 30 years before their collapse and judgment. So we've been preaching through mostly about Judah in the last couple of years with the book of Jeremiah and so forth that we've been studying on Wednesday nights. Um, but that is the, the southern kingdom and their destruction. This is the northern kingdom and their destruction. The Assyrian Empire comes in and wipes them out. So this is about 30 years before destruction. So in, in most of our lifetimes, he will preach and then the destruction will come because his message is unheeded. His message is, is not listened to. We're still looking at the what, the when, the where. So I, I just put this here. Um, they are wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. He is prophesying or preaching in a wealthy time. Very wealthy time. Look in chapter number 3, if you would, and verse number 15. Chapter number 3 and verse number 15. He's prophesying and preaching to wealthy and elite people. Wealthy and elite people. Chapter number 3, verse number 15. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house. What's that mean? It means there's people who have two houses. I, I wouldn't mind having a winter house and a summer house. I wouldn't mind having a winter house, I don't know, somewhere down in, in uh, Orlando, Florida, Tampa, Florida, somewhere by the beach, you know, where it's uh, 75, 80 degrees this week. I talked to Jesse Delgado, and he goes, it's so funny. I talked to him on Wednesday. He said it's 79 degrees, and everybody's wearing jackets and hoodies. It's their fall. They're transitioning from summer to fall. He goes, but just two weeks ago, it was 108 degrees, and so people are cold at 80, at 79. And I go, well, I think that morning while we were talking, I said, I think it's like 22 degrees here right now. And he goes, I would take it. And I said, done, let's switch. Let's blink our eyes, whatever we need to do to, to switch places, we could do that. They have a summer home. They have a winter home. They're, they're, they're wealthy. And the houses of ivory shall perish. And the great house shall have an end, saith the Lord. Houses of ivory. Even back then, ivory was a rare thing. Uh, ivory has only ever been made one way. Elephants. And so, to have a house built of ivory, imagine how expensive that would be. And then he calls it a great house. Then they have a summer house. And they have a winter house. They're, they're, they're well to do. Chapter 6 and verse number 4. Chapter 6 and verse number 4. That lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. So he says you're, they're, they're in chapter 3 verse 15 he says they have multiple houses and, and uh, winter houses, uh, summer homes, ivory. Here he says they lay upon their beds of ivory and uh, they eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. You eat a lamb or you eat a calf because it's better meat. It's more tender. It's, it's bad grammar, good understanding. It's more delicious. The older it gets, the tougher it gets. The, but if you eat it when it's young, it's smaller. And it won't grow. You can't eat your calf and have it too. What he's saying by this is, they're not concerned about amounts. They're concerned about quality. They're wealthy enough, they don't have to worry about the amount of food they're going to eat. They're eating the best of the food the, 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 with, no, with no foresight or no, no concern about the future because they have enough. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 17 talk about the church of Laodicea. Jesus says, or God says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That same description of the church of Laodicea could have been given to the nation of Israel at this time. No, no, I am rich and increased with goods. I, I have need of nothing. You don't, you don't understand, Pastor. I'm okay. We're, we're doing all right. Other people might struggle. Other people might need the gospel. Other people might need Jesus. We're doing okay. I've used this illustration before, so forgive that. But years ago, we had a young man, we'll give his first name, named Joe. 
Joe had a brilliant mind, brilliant mind. He came to us, I uh, believe, at the age of 16 or 17, came into our youth department, got saved, got excited about the things of God, and just, just really began to grow, uh, believed that the Lord had called him to preach. My personal opinion was it was God's design for him to be sort of a biblical author, a biblical scholar. He was of that, he was of that mind. He used to play on long road trips, like driving out to Colorado. He would play games with uh, my wife and other of the leaders where they would come up with a weird Bible name, and you had to find out what book of the Bible it was in and, and so forth. And my wife, who had been saved for many, many years and was a Bible college student, all those kinds of things, could not stump him after about six months. She could come up with the weirdest, most obscure Bible name, and he would know what book of the Bible it was in. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. Well, he wanted to go to Bible college, and his parents were very much against that. Uh, his parents were very, very wealthy. One worked for the government. One was a lawyer. And uh, they invited me to their home to discuss um, uh, their son, Joe. And, and uh, uh, so we went and uh, uh, came in and sat down. And the dad said this to me. He said, Park, I am very thankful for what you, the church, and the church have done for the kids of Shadyside, for the, for the kids in Anne Arundel County. And, and he goes, no doubt, no doubt. You've been a blessing to kids who are suicidal. You've been a blessing to kids who don't have parents. You've been a blessing to kids who don't have other options. So thankful. He said, literally, I think our society, our town is better because of First Baptist Church in Deal. But you don't understand. My son's not like that. He's got options. My son's not like those kids. He's going to go to college on a full scholarship. My son's going to be an architect. My son's going to be a millionaire. My, my son has choices. Thank you for ministering to those kids. But my kid is not like those kids. Unbeknownst to him, his son had already attempted suicide multiple times. Multiple times. His wife had hid it from the dad. And by the way, the last I heard, uh, the son had blown his mind on drugs and alcohol and was now struggling. He worked part-time at a grocery store um, under the... Uh, government program of hiring the handicapped. The way of the transgressor is hard. No, no, the dad said this, we're fine. You don't understand, but son, did you see the house when you pulled in? Did you see the cars when you pulled in? Did you, did you, see, did you see our education when you pulled in? Did you see our diplomas on the wall? We're good! We're good! That's what the nation of Israel would have argued back to Amos. Did you see our summer home? Did you see our winter home? Did you see our houses made of ivory? Did you, did, you, did you smell the baby calf cooking? Did you smell the lamb cooking? We're, we're, we're good. We're good. They were fine, or so they thought. An outline of the book of Amos would go something like this. Chapters 1 and 2 would be the eight burdens of nations. I know that sounds very broad. Simply put, he lists in chapters 1 and 2 eight different nations and their sins. He starts off with other nations and then drills down, the last two are Judah and Israel. Okay, so he starts off preaching against Tyre and, and Sidon and those, and then he narrows it down uh, to the nations of Israel and Judah. In chapters 3 through 6, he lists the what's and the why's of judgment. Okay, chapter 3 to 6, he's like, this is what's going to happen to Israel, and this is why it's going to happen. If 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 people go to hell, and they do because they reject Jesus Christ, if people go to hell, may they go to hell over our protesting. May they go to hell while going around our warnings, going around our, our attempts to stop them. And so in chapters 3 to 6, judgment is being warned about. They're being told, no, no, this is what you're doing wrong. And, and this is why judgment is going to fall if you don't fix it. Chapters 7 to 9, he lists the five illustrations that we talked about earlier. The grasshoppers, the fire, the plumb line, uh, the summer fruit. And then lastly, the last illustration is God standing up. He talks about God standing on the altar. And uh, the significance there is this. Just very simple. We'll get to it eventually. But uh, uh, we've all probably had parents who said, stop, stop. And then all of a sudden they stood up. And when they stood up, you're like, that's, that's the illustration. God is standing up. He's, he's, he's had enough. He's warned you enough. He, he's standing up. And then, believe it or not, chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, is the final promise to Israel. And it's grace. It's grace. Even the harshest, listen, even the harshest book in the Bible, from one of the harshest preachers in the Bible, 
ultimately comes back to a message of grace. Because we can have grace before judgment, or we can have grace after judgment, but grace is available if we'll turn to God and listen to God. Grace is always available. So that's the book of Amos. Let's make some quick application here uh, this morning because we never want to just... Information without application uh, leads to just being prideful and arrogant. Come on, when we know what the Bible says, but we don't know how to apply what the Bible says, then it just leads to uh, 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 pride and, and arrogance. So our first lesson from what we've covered so far today would be this. God has the right to call anyone at any time. God has the right to call anyone at any time. We don't know exactly how old Amos was when he, when he starts. We know later on when he dies, but uh, uh, he's an elderly man when he gets called into the service of the Lord here. Do not get so comfortable in what you think that you are that you turn a deaf ear to what God wants you to be. Do not get so comfortable in what you think that you are that you turn a deaf ear to what God calls you to be. Okay, so we're going to go back to Brother Gabe and Miss Diane, pray for their marriage. Okay, Brother Gabe, one, uh, this is this is this is just kind of how men work. If I if I meet Brother Lasaco, I uh, one of the first things I would do is I'd say Park Sutton, and then he would tell me his name, and then after we talk for just a little bit, invariably one of the first questions men are going to ask each other is this. What do you do? Come on, men are kind of defined by what they do. In, in our human society, in our culture, we're kind of defined by, by what we do. So Brother Gabe uh, uh, is, a, is a truck driver. He's a very good truck driver. He's a very skilled truck driver. He's a truck driver. So Brother Gabe's driving his truck and serving the Lord and, and tithing, per our previous conversation. Buying a house, a summer home and a winter home. I mean, he's buying both. He's... Money, money, money. And he's just, he's content in life. He, he serves the Lord. He comes to church. He's got a wife. He's got, he's got two daughters. They're kind of, they're not on the hunt, but he's looking forward uh, to the time when they would find special guys and then get married and, and grandbabies and, and uh, uh, retirement and ski trips and visits to national parks. He's, I mean, his life is just pretty much, it's kind of set, right? He's not, it's not like, Brother, Brother Gabe is not like walking around like some of our 16, 17, 18-year-olds going, what am I going to do with my life? He, he, he kind of already has that question settled. Who he's going to marry is settled. The big questions of life are settled. And so it, it might be in his mind that he's just thinking, this is how it's going to be for the rest of life. And it might be. Or it might be that God comes in and goes, uh, Amos, I have a burden for you to bear. I'm going to completely switch your calling. I'm going to completely switch your direction. You're not going to be a truck driver anymore. Now you're going to be missionary to Zambia. I'm just making stuff up here. God has the right to call any of us at any time. These first three rows are normally our, 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 our teenagers and our young people. And I trust that you would all echo this or amen this. God has the right to call them to where he wants them to be. No, no, God has the right. And they will be more content and more satisfied and more joyful if they surrender to that call. Can I say that's true of every row in this auditorium? God has the right to call you into his service. Now, let me be clear. He's not going to call you, but the Gabe's never going to call you to a different wife. That's already been settled. But he might call you to a different avenue of service. Might call you to a a, a different location. Might call you to a a different thing. Amos was just a guy. He was was just a servant. He, He had no particular skills that we are aware of that would have warranted or necessitated him going into ministry or or facilitated that. Yet God comes to him and calls him out of one ministry and into another ministry. God has the right to call anyone anytime. And, listen, just like we would say to the young people, our lives will be more content and more joyful if we surrender to that call. I remind you, most of, particularly in the New Testament, as we read the New Testament, most of the people God called into ministry in the New Testament, he called after they were married and already had kids. No, they were already married and had kids. We typically think of surrender as being something for the first three rows. They were already married and had kids when God called them into a higher level of service. Number one, God has the right to call anyone, anywhere, anytime. Number two, God can, has, 
and does use anyone. God can, God has, and God does use anyone. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. God's not going, okay, who's qualified to do this? No, he goes, I I want him to do it, and then I will qualify him so he can do it. Whatever the will of God is for that individual. Now, there are, there are restrictions with that, of course. Uh, if you're divorced multiple times, you can't be a pastor, can't be a deacon, those kinds of things. There are some restrictions on that. But God's not going to call you to that because he's the one that made the restriction. But anything God calls you to, he will give you the ability to perform. God can use anyone. Uh, whether it be weight loss or perhaps glow-ups, before and after pictures are kind of funny. The pickup truck, you know, the, the 1977 Chevy pickup truck that's all rusted out and beat up and whatever, the before picture, then the after picture after it's been remade and, and gone through and, and completely restored. But the more that vehicle shows up and is around, the more we think of that vehicle that way. We forget what it used to be. We just look at it what it is and we forget what it used to be. Many of our heroes of the faith, we forget what they used to be. King David wasn't King David when he was called. Remember Samuel comes and says, God's God's told me of the house of Jesse that somebody in the house of Jesse is going to be the next king of Israel, and I've come to anoint him. Let's just just pretend, Brother Jay. Brother Jay's got multiple boys. So we come to Brother Jay, and I say, all right, Brother Jay, uh, we'll have you be Jesse today, all right, the father of David. And, And so I come in, I'm Samuel, and I'm like, one of your boys is going to be king. One of your boys is going to be king. Bring all your boys in. Let me take a look at them. I'm going to anoint one of them. They're going to be the next king of the nation of Israel. That would be an exciting thing. He brings all of them in but Zayden. And I go through all of them. And I go, is that? I, I don't think it's this one. I don't think it's this one. I don't think it's this one. Do you, do you have any other boys? And he goes, yeah, Zayden. <laughs> it's not going to be Zayden. No way it's Zayden. He's got red hair. This is what Jesse says about David. He's got red hair. He's ruddy. He's got freckles. He's short. No way, it's David. His dad didn't think enough of him to bring him in to talk to the prophet. And Samuel goes, well, we're not going to eat. Samuel goes, I'm not leaving until I see all of your boys. And then he alters it a little bit. It says, I'm not leaving, I'm not eating until we see all your boys. That motivated Jesse. If we can't eat until you see David, I guess we'll see David, bring David in. And David comes in and he goes, that's the man. That's the man. The sweet psalmist of Israel. The man after God's own heart. Come on. The killer of Goliath. The writer of a fifth of the sixth of the Bible. Somewhere in that, in, in that ballpark. Um, the, the one who to this day is still recognized by the nation of Israel as their greatest king. Their, their, their greatest leader. I mean the man. How many of you know somebody named David? Can I tell you we name people David because of the after. Not because of the before. Because the before his dad was like. Satan? Not Satan. No, no. David. David. How about Gideon? The book of Gideon, the book of Judges, excuse me, not the book of Gideon, the book of Judges, chapter 6. Gideon is threshing wheat to hide it from the Amalekites. And in chapter 6, verse number 15, uh, the angel shows up to him and says that you're going to lead the nation of Israel. He says, Behold, thou mighty man of valor. Verse 15, this is what Gideon says. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He says, "I'm I'm from the smallest tribe, I'm from the poorest family in my tribe, and I am the least in my family. You wonder where the expression redheaded stepchild comes in? Back to David, but that's what he's saying. He goes, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, we're in the smallest tribe, my family's the poorest in the tribe, and I am the least in my family. And God uses him to destroy the Amalekites and lead the nation of Israel. How about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Now, she is a woman of character. I want to I be very clear about that. She's a woman of character. But she's not a woman of renown. Not before. No, no. There was nothing. God didn't say of Mary, I hail, thou art highly favored, because you have an education from Harvard. Because of your family lineage and your lust, illustrious history. No, she was poor. She grew up poor. 
How do you know she grew up poor? Because a father would, would only allow his daughter to typically marry someone who is of an upper class or a, a higher uh, financial level than they were. Joseph was a carpenter. What was her dad? If being a carpenter's wife was a step up, what was, jo- what was Mary's family? But we don't think back at Mary and go, oh, what a poor little girl. I mean, just didn't have much going. And we look back and go, that's the blessed Virgin Mary. That's the, that's the mother of Jesus Christ. That she, she's highly favored. Why? Because of what God did with her. Even Amos here. God used Amos. What's Amos? He's a farmer. He, he, he's a part-time rancher and a part-time farmer. Uh, he's a full-time worker, but a part-time nothing. Uh, a part-time many things, excuse me, because he's not a full-time anything. He, he, he has no money. And yet God uses him to give his message to an entire nation of people, a upper crust nation and group of people. I put it this way, it's not the golf clubs, it's the golfer. It's not the golf clubs. I, I'm, not, I'm not a golf, I haven't, I haven't golfed in years. Uh, probably five years ago was the last time I ever I play, played golf and I wasn't really all that much into it. But I know this, um, golf clubs can get super expensive. Super expensive. I mean, you can, you can $5,000, $6,000 for a set of golf clubs, you can could, you could absolutely do that. Do you think if I went and got a $5,000 pair of, uh, a set of golf clubs, $5,000 set of golf clubs, you think I could go pro? I didn't think it was that funny. You think I could go pro? You think I could, you know, go compete in the majors? And uh, uh, here in a couple weeks, I'm going down to uh, Augusta, Georgia. I'm actually flying into Augusta, Georgia, to preach a revival meeting. And Augusta, Georgia is home of the Masters. You think if I just showed up and be like, "Hey, I'm ready to compete. Five thousand dollar golf clubs." No, because the truth is, the golf clubs could help a little, but it's not the golf club. It's the golfer. It's who controls the club. I have a set of Arnold Palmer axioms, legitimately there from 1972 in my garage. That's, that's, that's my golf clubs. But I guarantee you the right golfer could come in and take those golf clubs and still compete. Because it's not the club, it's who holds it. it, it it's not the item, it's who, 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 who dictates it, who swings it. I'd say it's not you or I, it's who controls us. God can use anyone has used anyone, and does use anyone. Number three, we have to hurry, we'll we'll, we'll be done. Prosperity doesn't mean spirituality. Prosperity doesn't mean spirituality. We often think that when there's money in the bank, the car's running great, the job is going well, that means that we're right. Come on, that's what we think. That's what we think. This isn't true. Illustration purposes only. I haven't been to the doctors in months. My boss just gave me a raise. My car hasn't broke down. I don't, I don't even remember the last time my car broke down. Yesterday morning. But I don't even remember the last time my car broke down. Come on. My, my tires seem to never go flat. I guess, you know, sad for you sinners. No, prosperity doesn't mean spirituality. They were wealthy beyond what they knew what to do. And yet, it doesn't mean that they were spiritually correct. In Luke chapter 12 and verse number 15, Jesus said this, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So you go, well, Brother Park, man, life is going great for me. You're like that family in Maryland. And you're going, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm a lawyer. She she works for the government. We're we're, we're good. Life, Life couldn't be better for us. But you know or not that you are miserable and blind and naked, as the prophet said. No, you, you don't even know. You don't even realize. Just because things are going well uh, 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 financially or prosperity-wise doesn't mean you're actually right. Very quickly, the opposite is also true. But the park, my car keeps breaking down. What is God trying to show me? He, he may be trying to show you something. He might be. Ask him. But God has no problem telling you what he's trying to show you. Because think about it, if he's trying to show you something, he wants you to know something. He's not trying to show you something that's a secret. And I have never, I have never been disciplined by my father, my physical father, but what he didn't tell me why I was being disciplined. I have never, nor will I ever be disciplined by my spiritual father without him telling me why I'm being disciplined. Why does my car keep breaking down? It's a Ford. 
It's a form. Well, why do I keep being sick? We're 85. That's going to happen. Well, well why, does, why does my hip hurt? Why does my back hurt? Uh, you were a rodeo clown for 25 years. What did you think would happen in the, in, in, the, in the long run? Because things are going well doesn't mean you're spiritual, and because things aren't going well doesn't mean that you're not. Number four, and lastly, God has a higher standard for his kids. God has a higher standard for his kids. Chapters one and two, he preaches to eight nations, including, including Israel and Judah in the first two chapters. The next seven chapters, he just preaches to Israel and Judah. His, his people, his, his kids, if you would. Why? Because uh, uh, when you claim to be related to him, he holds you to a higher standard. He holds you to a higher standard. Uh, th- there might be a kid that comes running through the auditorium, and I'll be like, hey, slow down. Slow down, calm down. And, uh, you know, he, he plops down on the chair, and, and he's being obnoxious, whatever. Uh, come on, come on, calm down. Now imagine Mark does that. My response to Mark is going to be a lot more severe and a lot more blunt than it would be to a 16-year-old who's the first time they've come to church. Why? Because he's my son. No, I I hold my son to a higher standard. God holds his sons and daughters to a higher standard. He has the right to. As we study this passage, as we study this passage, here's going to be the two lenses we're going to look at the passage through. Okay? So uh, here's, we're going to use my glasses this morning. Uh, Hate hate them. But anyhow, um, Okay, there's two lenses on our glasses, right? Two lenses. Uh, sometimes different people have different prescriptions. Their left eye might have one prescription, their right eye might have a different, different prescription. You have bifocals, you have you know, near, far, all those kinds of things. I, I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm, I'm chasing y'all, but I'm not there yet. Okay. So here is how we are going to look at Amos. We're going to look at it through two lenses. Lens number one, God can use us. Let him. No, no, we're going we're to look at it through the Amos lens. God, God can use us. Let him. Let him use you. Let him make a difference with your life. Lens number two. God warns us. Listen. God wants to use us. Let him. God wants to warn us. Listen. That's how we're going to look at the book of Amos, through those two lenses. And I trust it'll be a blessing to you. Lord, I love you. Thank you for this text. Help me in the preaching in the morning service. Uh, may, Lord, we listen to you in Jesus' name. Amen. About three minutes late. I-